Welcome to this virtual seminar on the Houthis and the internationalization of the Hamas-Israel war. This event is part of an ongoing collaboration between the Moshe Dayan Center and the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University, as we try to understand the dynamic relationships between the Middle East and Asia with a particular focus on China. My name is Brandon Friedman. I'm a senior research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center. I'm joined today by Dr. Ori Sella and Ari Heistein. Ori, my partner in this endeavor, is a sinologist, a senior lecturer in the Department of East Asian Studies, and a visiting researcher at the Israel-China Policy Center, the Diane and Guilford Glazer Foundation at the INSS. Uh, Ari was a chief of staff to Amos Yadlin at the INSS, and he now works in defense technology and has published detailed and policy-relevant research on the Houthis in Yemen. Thank you, Ari and Ori, for being with us today. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, introduce our topic uh, for our viewers. We're now nearly three weeks into the Houthi escalation around the Bab al Mandab, which is in English the Gate of Tears Strait. Um, container shipping through the Red Sea has ground to nearly a halt. Most major international cargo carriers have suspended shipping through the Bab al Mandab. Companies like Maersk, CMA, CGM, Hapag Lloyd, uh, MSC, as well as Costco, um, have all either stopped or limited uh, their ships transiting through the Red Sea uh, and the Suez Canal um, because of the Houthi attacks on shipping. The United States has formed a coalition. Um, uh, its size uh, it has roughly been declared at around 10, though some, uh, some uh, claim that it's a much larger coalition of countries. Uh, and this operation has been uh, named Operation Prosperity Guardian to protect international sh shipping through the Red Sea. Um, it is notable that China is not part of this uh, US-led operation. Um, I also would like to note that in November, um, there was a distress call from an Israeli-owned Liberian flagged vessel off the Horn of Africa. China did not respond. Uh, this was the vessel, the Central Park. It was under attack. Um, who was attacking the vessel has been debated. Um, there were reportedly three Chinese vessels in the area. Um, nevertheless, uh, we see China, um, at least at the declarative level, um, <clears throat> publishing um, a statement suggesting that uh, Chinese naval resources in the region are available to provide escorts to ships in distress um, in the uh, Bab al Mandeb, Red Sea, uh, Gulf of Aden area. During this event, what we'd like to do is look at the Houthis in particular, and then as well as the regional and international consequences of the Houthi attack on um, shipping through uh, the Red Sea and the Bab al Mandeb, and how they stand to influence not just Israel and the war uh, in Gaza, but um, more uh, globally, um, regional and international relations. Um, and with that brief introduction, uh, let me now uh, turn the conversation over to uh, our esteemed guests um, and ask a few questions and hopefully we can have a, uh, a conversation about these developments. Um, Ari, why don't we start with you and, and um, if you could help us understand a little bit about who the Houthis are, uh, who Ansar Allah is, um, when did they seize power in Yemen, um, and, and briefly, whatever you th think might be relevant for us to know about the Houthis in Yemen. Sure. Thank you, Brandon, for that introduction. Um, so the Houthis today look very different than they started out. They started out in the 80s as basically a youth movement that consisted of a summer camp and uh, some study groups for the children of Sada, which is really a backwater province uh, in Northern Yemen. Then after, I guess, a few years of doing that, they essentially moved on to uh, uh, electoral politics. Um, they formed the Al-Haq party. This was a pretty unsuccessful endeavor I, th I think the most they ever won was really two seats. And during this time, the party was under the leadership of Hussein al-Houthi, who was the founder of the movement. Um, and then they reinvented themselves once more in the early 2000s when they became a, a guerrilla movement. 
this was around the time that we can see um, it, the movement took a turn. You see that really what happened, they invented this new scream that's, uh, you know, the famous uh, God is great, our death to America, uh, death to Israel, um, first the Jews and victory to Islam. They invented that around 2002. And then they started their guerrilla warfare against the central government, the government of Ali Abdullah Saleh. That was around 2004. Hussein al-Houthi was killed uh, pretty early on in the fighting. He was killed in 2004. His father, Badr al-Din al-Houthi, took over for a short while and then passed over the reins to the current uh, supreme leader of the Houthis, um, Abdul Malik al-Houthi. Abdul Malik al-Houthi has guided the movement uh, since then, so that's almost 20 years. Um, and during that time, the, the movement has really gone from being a small guerrilla movement to a participant in the Arab Spring and the National Dialogue Conference in Yemen after um, uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh was deposed in the Arab Spring. Um, so for about two years, they were participating in this National Dialogue Conference from 2012 until 2014. Um, and then in 2014, when the government removed some fuel subsidies, they took advantage of popular uh, disappointment or uh, dismay with that move. And they also took advantage of their alliance with the deposed president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And they started their march on Sana'a and they took over the city. And they did not stop there. They really moved from Sana'a all the way to uh, the outskirts of Aden. That's when the, that was around 2015. And that's when the Saudi coalition started its uh, campaign to really push back on the Houthis. And then I would say for the last, Basically, since 2018, we've been in a stalemate, uh, a military stalemate, where we haven't seen much movement in either direction. And then for the last uh, two, two or so years, what we've really seen is uh, the conflict has been frozen. There's been something of a ceasefire. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been any exchanges of fire in either direction. Hundreds of people are still being killed along the front lines, but compared to what we have seen Prior to that, it, it's basically a low-intensity conflict. So that's, um, I guess, in a nutshell, um, about the rise of the Houthis. In terms of their ideology, um, I don't really think that you can say it's a coincidence that the movement arose uh, shortly after uh, the Iranian Revolution. Um, they seem very heavily influenced by, by the Iranian Revolution. Um, and I would also say that you can see this in some of their terminology, in addition to the, um, I guess, statutes that they have implemented in, in uh, the territory they control. You see they use terms like soft war, which uh, are very familiar to people who have studied Iran for a long time. It's the same kind of thing, I think, they, uh, that they say in Iran. Same, Obviously, one's in Arabic and one's in Farsi, but that's really the only difference. And, and I think that really reflects their worldview, is they feel that they're in a constant... Um, struggle with the propaganda of the West, with the imperialism of the West. It's also based, the Houthi uh, ideology is also based on a very paranoid worldview in which the West and Israel are basically the source of all of their problems. So that's uh, a few words about their ideology. Great. All right. We'll get back to some of those issues um, in a few minutes, but but if I could, um, uh, Ori, if I could turn to you and, and ask, um, whether we see reactions from China with respect to the Houthi escalation um, in the Red Sea, uh, particularly from the end of November until today, um, or, or whether the Chinese are simply silent about all of this. Um... Thank you, Brandon. Um, I, I'd like to, to give a brief kind of a more historical background to the what we can call the, the Chinese silence on the matter um, during the past, uh, well, pretty much two months, uh, I would say for now. Um, the first thing we need to remember is that uh, during the time of uh, uh, what Ari has been uh, describing earlier, during those uh, first couple of decades, uh, first in the first decade and uh, well into the middle of the second decade of the uh, 2000s, um, the, the Chinese were trying to invest more and more in Yemen, right? They, they were bringing in 
both investments and workers so that uh, in 2015, uh, right after the, the war uh, began, uh, China had to evacuate um, its uh, citizens from Yemen. And, and it did so quite effectively uh, with its Navy. And after that, the, the interesting thing is that China continued uh, to have uh, low key ties with the Houthis, not just with the Yemeni government. So Ch uh, China uh, in the Houthi Yemen issue, even before uh, the current war here, uh, China was uh, playing both sides um, for quite some time, which means that China also did not uh, denounce or act against the Houthis uh, during all of those uh, violent uh, uh, occurrences uh, in the past eight years. Okay, so, so that's something we need to keep in mind. That's in general. More specifically, even in uh, last September, uh, that's three and a half uh, months ago, uh, as you may recall, there was a Houthi attack, right? I think there were two Bahrainian soldiers that were killed. I imagine that wasn't an, a, a solitary event, uh, but it was uh, an event that uh, caught the global eye so to speak. And back then, when China was asked for its opinion, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the response was, and I quote, China opposes actions that escalate tensions and calls on relevant parties to work in the same direction towards a political settlement through dialogue and restore peace and stability at an early date. How nice. Um, we may also recall that in March uh, of last year, when China uh, pr was very proud of uh, having the Iranians and Saudis uh, come to Beijing to sign a, a sort of a rapprochement uh, deal, back then it was reported that the Houthi issue was part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the deal. That is uh, on the sidelines, but still an important part of it. Obviously, the September attack was not in line with that. China did nothing except uh, saying this uh, very beautiful thing that I just quoted, and that's that. So when we get to um, late October and November and so on, and the Houthi uh, attacks, the Chinese silence on the matter um, was not a big surprise, but still, um, we'll get to that later on, but still, uh, China was also affected by it. Uh, we'll discuss it later. And uh, the fact that China was uh, uh, silent on the matter um, was uh, taken a bit to the extreme. I will only say, uh, apart from, uh, from that, that during, those, uh, during the past uh, two months, the UN Security Council uh, issued its own um, first uh, reproachment of the Houthis and also uh, a, a president's uh, kind of uh, address, the, the president, the temporary president of the UN Security Council that also denounced the Houthis. Um, and China didn't say anything uh, on its own, but being a part of the uh, UN Security Council um, by kind of uh, indirect means uh, China was part of that. But specifically and explicitly, China did not denounce the Houthis uh, to this day. Thank, thank you, Ori. Um, I, I think as part, as part of the background to the 2015 evacuation, um, and we'll, we'll maybe have time to address it a little bit more in, in a few minutes, is Obviously, the fact that the China established a naval station in Djibouti, which which is very very close to the events that uh, we're, we're discussing here, in the sense that um, Ch China's uh, major naval assets uh, were introduced to the region at Djibouti, um, where where they remain today. Um, and, and it's not just China with major naval assets there now; it's also obviously the Americans and. Um, and, and several other countries, and, and, and this is all quite close, um, and perhaps, Ari, you can have something to say about this, uh, within range of, of the Houthi um, military capabilities. Um, so in effect, the Houthis have the ability to strike um, it, those countries that are based in Djibouti, um, if it so chose to do so. Um, but but let's, um, 
let's uh, take a step back and perhaps uh, Ari, I could turn to you um, and talk a little bit about um, sort of the compartmentalization of conflicts going on here, because um, it's very interesting. Um, you alluded to the fact that the um, the Saudi war uh, with the, with the Houthis um, has sort of been um, caught between what uh, a very uh, what seems to be um, tenuous ceasefire it's held and, and in fact there was some agreement uh, a UN brokered agreement for a roadmap to perhaps extending the cease ceasefire in the last couple of weeks um, on one hand the Saudis seem keen to preserve that uh, agreement with the Houthis uh, meaning they don't seem to want to be dragged into uh, the current conflict in the Red Sea, um, which is why we've seen the Saudis uh, keep a relatively low profile on, on these attacks. So you have the Houthi-Saudi war on one hand, um, and you also have, obviously, the um, Israel's war with Hamas in Gaza on the other hand. Um, and so these, what it seems like is going on here is that um, the parties are trying to keep these two conflicts separate. Um, and the question is whether that compartmentalization is realistic, um, uh, whether there'll be overlap. Um, obviously, it's a, hard to predict the future, but maybe you could explain uh, in, a, in a much more clear way than I am now uh, how this is evolving. Yes, yeah, so I think that's uh, actually a great question because as much as the outside parties probably want to compartmentalize what's going on in Yemen, I don't think the Houthis see it that way. And I'll give you my own theory about this. Um, so in this, the previous summer, in the summer of 2023, we saw that there was um, really, what can only be described as very unusual or exceptional unrest among the Houthi, like in the Houthi territories. You had the teachers union speaking out, which is very unusual because it's a place with no freedom of speech and they were complaining about the Houthis not paying salaries. What, we also saw that the GPC, um, Saleh's party, speaking out against the Houthis and supporting the teachers union. Um, it's the, I guess, most significant political actor. Obviously there's no real political life in Houthi territory, but it's the most significant political actor outside of the Houthi party um, or the Houthi organization. And they were also speaking out against the non-payment of government employee salaries and you, feel, you sense that there's this uh, increasing pressure that seems very unusual for what the Houthis have experienced thus far. And it's also an organization that has many domestic intelligence agencies and security agencies that tend to stamp out any opposition uh, as, as it's appearing. Um, and so um, my take on how all of this these three fronts tie together is that essentially what you have is the Houthis um, trying to um, reach some sort of agreement with Saudi Arabia so that they will receive compensation. They don't really have any plan to deal with the economic problems in Yemen. And my guess is that in general, they're probably only making them significantly worse, both through their poor governance, but also um, so much of what Yemen consumes is produced externally. If insurance prices are going up, that means everything that Yemenis are buying is basically also becoming more expensive. Um, so this is one way to deal with the economic crisis at home and also to prevent any external actors from interfering in what they do uh, domestically within Yemen. On the Israeli side of things, the way I see it is that this was probably a target of opportunity, but um, Israel provided one of the few um, avenues for acting in a consent, like in a way that has consensus opinion in Yemen, targeting Israel is, I think, a very popular thing to do, and therefore something that they can do uh, in order to gain uh, significant support at a time when their local support is, or the domestic support is really sagging. And then I believe uh, this is my own uh, conjecture, but I believe that what we're gearing up for is actually. Uh, the Houthis opening up the um, the inter-Yemeni uh, front. I, th I think what we're going to see is escalation domestically within Yemen, the Houthis uh, restarting the conflict to, or the uh, their efforts to take Marib and some other key areas within Yemen. Um, and I think if you 
look at all of these uh, fronts or all of these different arenas um, in an integrated way. It seems like they've really managed to, they're managing to tick all their boxes or achieve all of their aims in a very neat and uh, strategic way. But, uh, that's really important. I, you, I mean, you were addressing the, uh, one of the key issues that I think hasn't been discussed is what is the Houthi interest here um, in involving themselves in the, in, um, in the war in Gaza. Uh, the way it's often portrayed in the popular media is that the Houthis are simply a puppet of Iran and, and they're therefore doing what Iran is bidding. And um, and, and what you gave us is a very uh, a clear uh, rationale for the Houthis um, pursuing their conflict with Israel that in a way that serves their own um, domestic needs. And I, I think that's an important perspective. Um, Ori, um, is, is China, we'll, we'll get to back to this question of the Houthi relationship with Iran um, in, in a few minutes, but um, has China really been affected by these attacks? I mean, um, you know, I talked about the cargo carriers, um, but but and we know that the, the Galaxy Leader, which was tied to Israel and, and was hijacked on November 19th, which is sort of when things began escal escalating, was actually um, being operated, if I'm not mistaken, by a Japanese company when it was taken. Um, but the question is, are Chinese ships or are Costco ships being targeted? Does China feel at risk? Um, and obviously, there are secondary ways that China is being affected. And maybe we should talk a little bit about those, right? It, it, China doesn't necessarily have to have its ships hijacked or, or its uh, um, or, or its own ships uh, directly attacked in order to feel the effects of all of this. Definitely. And uh, but first, first of all, let me say that there was uh, one ship that's uh, for certain a Chinese ship, the Maersk Gibraltar. Um, which is uh, owned, you know, the, the ownership uh, structure uh, for uh, the shipping industry is extremely complex. But this one is uh, is tied directly uh, to ownership by a Chinese uh, company. It was flying under the flag of Hong Kong, which, if you're a Chinese, is China. And uh, it was clearly a Chinese ship. Uh, it was targeted. A missile was shot at, her, at, at this ship, but uh, it, it missed. Uh, nonetheless, it was attacked. Um, here, we may also recall that uh, uh, you, you mentioned this uh, conflating uh, different arenas. Um, uh, for China, uh, these things are, are, are linked together. Um, the, the Israel front, the Houthi front, all of this is linked together. Uh, we didn't even mention the fact that the Houthis were, have been uh, firing um, missiles and drones at Israel um, for quite some time now. So th that's another aspect of this issue, again, which China did not uh, denounce in any way. Uh, one of the things that China did say uh, in late uh, December, a couple of weeks ago, uh, was uh, when it was asked whether or not China plan plans on playing any active role um, in uh, going against the Houthis, uh, China's reaction was uh, that, uh, uh, let me quote, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how it ties into your question. Uh, the remark was, the Red Sea, this is the quote, the Red Sea is an important international trade route for goods and energy. Safeguarding the security and stability of the region serves the common interest of the international community. China stands for protecting the safety of international sea lanes and against causing disturbance to civilian ships. We believe relevant parties, especially major countries with influence, we'll get back to that uh, later on, need to play a constructive role and responsible role in keeping the shipping lanes safe in the Red Sea, which is, again, a really nice uh, way of addressing it. Uh, that means absolutely nothing. I mean, China, after all, as you remarked in, in the introduction, uh, when there was a, a ship in distress uh, calling out for help, uh, that the three ships that you mentioned, these are Chinese Navy ships uh, there to protect the freedom of navigation. And they simply went out of the out of their way just to get away from the from it all. Um, at least this is the report. 
Now, what this statement uh, says, it goes again exactly to where you were hinting in that China knows very, very well that the Red Sea and of course, Bab el Mandab uh, within, the, you know, as, as the entrance to the Red Sea is uh, an extremely important um, shipping route. China knows that Chinese ships are going there or have been going there before the footies started uh, shooting. And this means that China's trade is affected by this uh, by these attacks. Let me remind our viewers that China is the largest um, uh, exporter in the world. And it's also uh, one of the largest importers in the world. So this means that Chinese ships are going back and forth in the Red Sea, going through the Suez Canal, in which China also has stakes. And uh, all of this means that when these ships uh, have to take the uh, the longer road um, and, you know, uh, circumnavigate uh, Africa, this means that China loses a lot of uh, money and th that the Chinese consumers also have to pay more, um, pretty similar to what Ari was saying earlier about uh, people in Yemen. I think um, just just to add some facts, 40% uh, of the Asia-Europe trade transits through the Bab al Mandeb, um, and 12% of all global maritime trade. And, and most, most of that Asia-Europe trade is China. from China. Plus, we can recall that the trade that goes via the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean, later often continues its way uh, to the west and to the eastern coast of the US and things like that. Sorry for interrupting you. No, no, it's it's an important fact. And, and I think also it's important, and we don't, we don't need to get into the intricacies of the shipping industry, which are quite complex, but you know, Costco is also one of the world's largest cargo carriers and, and China itself is, um, one of the world's largest shipping insurers. And, and so the costs, uh, the, the sort of the costs that are now getting the premiums or the surcharges that are added to, to, to the shipping companies by the shipping companies in order to, to pass along the costs, the increased costs as a result of the Houthi attacks um, are, are affecting China, China in a major way, I think. Um, and I, I um, it's something that we're just at the beginning of, so it's really hard to quantify accurately. And I've seen numbers, a lot of numbers uh, flying around, so I don't, I don't want to quote anything that's unreliable. Um, but I think assessing exactly how much um, how much damage potentially is done is really important. And, and just to give you one uh, Middle East related fact here that I thought was interesting, um, uh, Egypt uh, in 2021, 2022, uh, it, generated almost $10 billion in revenues from the Suez Canal, which is a huge amount of money for what is uh, an Egyptian economy, which is badly struggling. Um, and that that figure was up nearly $2 billion. It went from 7 billion to 9.4 billion from 2021, 22 to 22, uh, 22, 2022, 2023. Um, and it's obvious that as a result of this, it's going to affect those numbers for the coming fiscal year for Egypt. Um, and, and so these issues have extraordinary economic ramifications um, globally uh, for countries, for, for massive tra uh, global traders like China, but also regionally um, for, a, for a country with 120 million people like, like uh, Egypt. Um, I, Ari, if I could come back to you, um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about this relationship um, it, it's talked about a lot, but I think it's important to try to put it in, in its proper context, the relationship between Iran and the Houthis. Um, for example, the, the Wall Street Journal had this report saying that uh, an Iranian ship uh, was providing the Houthis with targeting information that it needed in order to carry out these attacks on commercial shipping. Um, how would you frame the relationship between the Houthis and Iran? You talked a little bit about the ideological affinity or, or ideological roots that they share. Um, how would you talk more about the practical nature of their relationship? Okay, so I would say that like the movement, uh, the Houthi movement, it has really evolved over time. Um, 
What you can see is that already from around 2009, the the Iranians were shipping the Houthis small arms and basic, uh, you know, ba very basic weapons, uh, not anything that would be unusual in the Yemeni context, RPGs, things like that. Um, and then I would say that during the um, period of an alliance between Ali Abdel Saleh and the, and the Houthis, I think that he, that Saleh and the Yemeni military people that he brought with him, as well as the equipment that he brought with him, uh, really filled that void in terms of serving as the uh, Iranian, as serving as the Houthis arms dealer. Um, then what you see, um, which is very interesting, in 2017, when Saleh tries to defect and then he is assassinated, you can then see a very uh, steep in increase or improvement in the relationship between Iran and the Houthis. That's when you start to see more sophisticated Iranian weapons uh, being used, um, strikes deeper into Saudi Arabia. Um, and really what we've seen is an exponential improvement over time. I mean, obviously, the Yemenis try and claim that all of these weapons are Yemeni produced. And they may have the ability to put them together in Yemen and, and maybe produce some very basic parts of specific weapons. But these are really very clearly, uh, you know, you just put the Iranian version of a weapon and the Yemeni version of a weapon side by side. And you can see that it's basically a paint job and a new name. And that's really the only difference between them. So I would say at this point, Iran is undoubtedly supplying Yemen with its most important weaponry, its strategic weaponry the ballistic missiles that it uses to target Israel, um, the anti-ship missiles that it uses. Um, so that's on the arms side of things. In terms of diplomacy, I would say that Iran is also the only place where Yemen has been able to open up an embassy, or the, where the Houthis have been able to open up an embassy. Um, beforehand, uh, until I guess October 2023, the Houthis also had an embassy in Syria. Uh, and my sense is that this was an embassy they were allowed to open under pressure from Iran on the Assad regime. Um, but based on the warming of ties between Saudi Arabia and the Assad regime, what we had seen, at least my reading of the situation, was that Saudi Arabia asked the Syrians to close this embassy and expel the Houthi diplomats. And that's really what happened. And that happened, I would say, I believe it was the 4th of October or very early on in October, right before the war started. Interesting. Brendan, if I may sure. jump in. Uh, Ari, could you um, could you perhaps, uh, on the other hand, kind of elaborate a little bit on the uh, Houthi Hezbollah uh, connection? Sure. So I'm ha happy to speak about that. Um, my sense is that a lot of what's happening in that relationship is really under the table, but there are a few things that we can see. Um, uh, first, I would say um, the Houthis, believe it or not, in uh, in Yemen, held a fundraiser for Hezbollah. Um, this was, I believe, in 2019. Um, and the idea was to convince people to donate their money to Hezbollah. My sense of the what was happening behind the scenes was that this may have been payment for some sort of training or services or weaponry that Hezbollah was providing the Houthis, but it was made uh, or publicized as some sort of solidarity with Yemen, with uh, with Lebanon and with uh, Hezbollah. And so the idea was to collect, um, I, th I believe they ended up collecting uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, for Hezbollah. So that's one aspect of the relationship. What I think may even be more interesting, though, is the relationship in terms of media. Um, obviously, uh, so Al Masira is, uh, which is the Houthi channel, is not based in Yemen. It's not based in Sana. It's based in Beirut. And what you can see is that really the production quality um, and so much of it, it just looks like a much more sophisticated channel than anything that el the else that's be being produced in Yemen. Um, and you can really see uh, what I would call the Houthi, the uh, Hezbollah fingerprint on it. Um, so in addition to that, you have um, the chairman, or I believe he's or the CEO 
of, uh, of Al-Nasira has very close ties to Hezbollah. He's pictured a lot at Hezbollah events. He's very, he's at the, he's on this nexus of Iran and Hezbollah. Um, and actually, I think just if we're going to bring up media, it's very important to note that so many of the key figures in, in the Houthi regime are actually media figures. And I think that a lot of them are probably people who went to these boot camps in 2012, 2013, that were put on by Hezbollah. Um, the Houthis helped to basically facilitate this flow of people who seem to have some sort of leadership potential, media potential. And they tried to facilitate a flow of these people to Beirut. And then some of them ended up uh, in, in Iran as well. Um, but uh, you look at the um, ambassador to the Houthi ambassador to Iran, he is a media person. You look at the um, most important figures from the uh, Houthi embassy in Syria when it was still open, all media people. Um, you can see the importance that they place on this. And this is something that really has been cultivated. All of these people, or many of them at least, have been cultivated by Hezbollah. I think that that's a really important point. In fact, the the background I'm using right now is from uh, the front page of Al Akbar, which is a, obviously a Hezbollah related media organ in Beirut. Um, on December 23rd, when when the Houthis basically um, declared war on Israel and and the United States as part of this escalation in the Red Sea, um, and, and so I think that the, that's a really really important point and and connection. And um, I. I I refrained from from making you all watch the minute uh, or minute and a half video I found of of that the which was a very polished media production that the Houthis put together on the same day that this sort of Al Akbar headline uh, came out, um, where which sort of shows the Houthis in the Red Sea preparing for for battle. Um, and uh, so, I, if Ari, that's a really great point. Um, Ori, if I could come back to you, I, I wanted to ask a question um, about this uh, American-led operation, which um, is designed, it, I think, to respond to concerns prim primarily from um, international cargo carriers. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about some of them, uh, Maersk and, and, and um, uh, uh, Lloyd Hopog and, and MSC and, and obviously Costco. Um, but but I think it seems like there's been a lot of um, pressure on the United States uh, to, to respond to international uh, economic concerns about um, Houthi threats on uh, commercial shipping. And the idea here is that it, with these increased shipping costs, it's going to drive global inflation. And this is happening at a point, and, and this is really the context for all for, for, for this, um, when basically the world is just beginning to get inflation under control since since the coronavirus pandemic emerged in late 2019. So so here we are three years later, and finally it seems like the battle with inflation is being won. Um, and here comes um, the Houthis, which are threatening to to, to drive inflation uh, right back up. And, and this is also an election year in the United States, and of course uh, Americans vote like most other countries that vote on their pocketbook. Uh, and, and so this stands to affect um, um, uh, American voters. So it, it all raises the question, um, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, this is the global commons protecting sea lanes. You know, th this, if you wanna be seen as a global stakeholder, a good actor in the international community, uh, this isn't, uh, seems like a no brainer, right? Um, uh, this is your chance to shine. So why is it um, that we see China on the sidelines? Um, why is China not um, itching for a place at the table in terms of showing how they can help protect the global commons? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, again, it, it connects with your earlier question about how the different arenas are connecting in different ways, because uh, when we look, for example, at uh, one of the major newspapers in China, well, websites uh, these days, the Global Times, the, which is uh, one of the party's uh, channels, of course. And uh, they published a piece, an editorial, um, a few weeks ago. I think it was two and a half weeks ago. And in that editorial, when they were talking about the Houthis and about 
the U.S. Uh, endeavors to um, to resist them, uh, what they said, the, this, what this editorial said, was that the Houthi issue is actually only, they called it a butterfly effect of the main issue. And what's the main issue? Well, obviously it's the uh, Israel-Hamas war, but much more than that. And that same newspaper, that same editorial said the following, the root cause of what the Houthis were doing, right? In Bab el-Mandab, in the Red Sea, the root cause is that the U.S. has never taken a fair stance, nor has it taken into consideration interests of the Middle Eastern countries, all countries, mind you, but rather approaches the Middle East issue based on its own hegemonic needs. What this editorial basically is saying is that the root cause is the U.S. behavior. It's not even Israel, by the way, right? Israel is, is the secondary side effect of the U.S. Uh, way of handling things. And the, the, the key word here is of U.S. hegemonic style uh, conduct in the region. And note that, th that China is trying to portray itself and has been also officially in uh, all official, official interviews and, and so on and so forth. Uh, China ha has been trying to portray itself as standing uh, with the side of the Arab countries, of the Muslim countries, of course, of the Palestinians, all of the Palestinians, including Hamas. So uh, for China, trying to say anything of the sort that it aligns itself with the U.S., and especially with, under the U.S. leadership in the U.S. operation against the Houthis, that would be a huge problem. And China is actually using it or manipulating these events in order to um, enhance its rhetoric of we stand by the Arab cause, we stand by the Muslim cause, we stand by the region, we are not hegemonic, it's the U.S. Uh, that caused the problem, it's the U.S. that tries to solve it in, in, in a very bad way right now, because the way to solve this butterfly effect, that's all it is, is not to fight it with, uh, with, with the destroyers, but rather to simply get the U.S. to get out of the Middle East, and to get Israel to stop fighting uh, Hamas. Why is Israel fighting Hamas? You know, it's interesting, it, 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 the, it, the argument, because obviously it seems to those of us who are watching is that the U.S. was on its way out, right? And and the last thing Biden seems to want is to, to come back in and, um, and certainly to come back in in a way that's going to end up with a, a the U.S. Um, do, doing the lion's share of the protecting in this case or fighting, um, and so th there does seem to me to be a bit of a tension here. Um, it, I think there are explanations for it, but um, it, it's almost as if the Chinese, Iran, and the Houthis were on the verge of getting what they wanted, which was the U.S. sort of focused elsewhere, and now the U.S. is being sucked back in, sucked back into the region. Uh, of course, that raises the question of whether China perhaps doesn't mind that the U.S. is sort of sucked back into the region, because that means perhaps the U.S. has less time and attention to devote to China and other issues, um, which is which is something to think about rather than a, a definitive statement. Um, meaning, we, or is something we've talked at length about is that, you know, the U.S. was preoccupied after 9-11 with issues relating to the Middle East, and to a great extent, this served Chinese interests. Um, and so it raises the question of whether the Americans being occupied with the Houthis also serves China's interests. Um, uh, sure. It, it, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very good question. But I think what we see now is that China's own narratives are not working that well because the, you know, that the, the U.S. withdrawal narrative, obviously the U.S. is not withdrawing right now. Maybe it will, but right now that's a, an obvious um, non-starter. 
and the Chinese narrative of we are a responsible major power. Remember, we, we said earlier, or I, I quoted earlier, the, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry is saying that uh, all major uh, powers should do their best. And if you're a, a player in the region, in the Middle East, and you're looking at China, uh, what you see is simply inaction. You see uh, lots of talk, but no, nothing that's actually being done. There's no action. So China's inaction in this case, I think harms its own narratives uh, pretty badly, at least for the moment. Uh, the long-term effect will have to wait. All right. Why do the Houthis want to fight the Americans? I mean, it, it seems like there's. A, a, it seems almost like they're 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 teasing or begging or provoking. It's almost like they want this fight. And you talked a little bit about how it may help them consolidate some of their uh, on the domestic front and and a distraction for some of their internal problems, which is a, a phenomenon we're, we're we're familiar with in this region, right? Um, but. It, it also it also seems you know on on the on in a very superficial way it's mind boggling that the Houthis are are, are out there um, uh, provoking the um, American naval forces. So, uh, how, how do you see the Houthis' desire to take on the Americans? And and it, it doesn't seem like it's just talk, right? Uh, they're they're out there every day now firing ballistic missiles towards um, in the direction of of uh, um, the American Navy. So. How do you see the Houthi, um, this Houthi gambit? So I agree with you. It does seem very insane to see people on uh, Houthis on what basically amount to armed rowboats taking on multi-billion dollar destroyers. Um, it, it, it seems insane. And I would argue that they are not doing it because they expect to win. I think there are two ways in which this really serves uh, the Houthi interests. The first is that, um, in general, what the Houthis for the last, um, basically since 2015, have been telling their people, you know, it's the Saudi Emirati American coalition that's destroying our country, they're bombing us, and therefore the situation is terrible. That's why, that's what explains why nobody can afford food, that's what explains why, you know, the, uh, um, Saudi currency is constantly being depre uh, in depreciation. Um, that was sort of their explanation for everything. And so, you know, there were people who were so convinced of this. I think it's Michael Knights who uh, who records this instance, but he there were genuinely Houthi soldiers who were captured in Yemen by uh, the Yemeni coalition, and by the uh, or the Saudi-led coalition. And they were shocked to find out that the people fighting them were actually Yemenis because they had been told that these were Israelis and Americans against them. And so you have this theory that like the Americans and the Israelis and the Saudis are destroying the country and that's why things are so bad. And so I think having a U.S. strike on Saudi on uh, on Houthi territory would in some ways allow them to go back to this narrative because they, in a way they've been denied the right to use this narrative for the last couple of years when things have been relatively calm, because during, uh, I guess what you could call like a, a ceasefire, even if it wasn't always uh, enforced, it's very hard to uh, explain that this Saudi campaign is destroying your country. And that's the reason why you don't have an economy when you sort of have a ceasefire with them. So I think returning to this narrative of an explanation why things are so bad is, is very useful for them. And I think it's the type of thing that a, a government does when they really have no prospect of improving the economy. And like I said, their governance is uh, atrocious. Um, it's incredibly corrupt uh, and very dysfunctional. And so I think the best thing, if you can't have a solution, I think the best thing they can have, hope for is an excuse. Um, and in addition to that, uh, beyond the practical level, on the ideological level, this idea that they're in confrontation with the US, I think really speaks to their ideology where there's something, uh, um, almost like primordial about it, where they're supposed to be in conflict with the U.S. The U.S. is constantly trying to undermine them, and therefore this is kind of what's supposed to happen, in, in a sense. It's um, it, it's 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 been foreordained or preordained, right? Um, 
it, it, that's an interesting, it, really interesting points. I, I want to turn to the Israeli issue now because we haven't really addressed it um, much. In, in the sense, um, the, the Houthis have been there in, in the very early stages of the war, or you mentioned it already, um, targeting southern Israel um, with drones and missiles. Um, some of those uh, attacks have actually uh, ended up in Egypt rather than in Israel. Um, and, and, and so Israel seems to have the ability to cope with the Houthi attacks from Yemen um, on, on Israeli territory. Um, and so the Houthis, in, in, in essence, have, have moved to an area where they can more effectively strike at Israel and perhaps, at the, again, at the United States and the international community. Um, how does Israel assess the, the Houthi role here in terms of um, Israeli interests in fighting the war against uh, Hamas and potentially with Hezbollah in the future? Um, it, is it given the same level of seriousness that Israel gives to Hamas and, and uh, Hezbollah? Is there a hierarchy here? Um, and, and maybe we can also talk about how potentially attacking uh, international economic interests would, would affect Israel as well. Uh, so either of you who want to address this, feel free. Uh, uh, I or think... I think Israel has been trying, and rightly so, uh, from the beginning, from the beginning of the Houthi attacks on the shipping lines, that is, um, has been trying to portray the, the Houthis as an international problem, um, meaning it's not Israel's issue. This is something that the international community has to respond to, and uh, you know, there are the grand declarations of if they want, we'll destroy the Houthis, okay, whatever. The main issue is trying to uh, really and concretely get the international community to uh, intervene. Interestingly, the Houthi attacks, uh, the, the, the missiles, the drones against Israel were intercepted not just by Israel. I mean, they were intercepted by the United States, they were also intercepted by the Saudis. So that's something actually that plays uh, to Israel's benefit, I would say, in the long run, and uh, something that Israel might even uh, uh, use in the future when we get to all kinds of talks and discussions uh, with the regional actors. But there's time for that. Right now, I would say that Israel is much, much more concerned, as, as we know, uh, with Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, I think that Israel is also uh, stating time and again, and um, I, I'm not sure if Ari would agree to that, but uh, time and again, that uh, all of these are, um, you know, Iran proxies, right? That uh, the Houthis are a proxy, that uh, Hezbollah is a proxy, and all of that. Now, obviously, Iran plays a, uh, plays a, a part in this game, in this horrible game. But uh, I think that, uh, as, as Ari uh, pointed out uh, really well earlier, uh, the Houthis have their own agenda, and, uh, and, and Hezbollah has its own agenda. So it makes the situation much more complex than simply it's an Iranian-led uh, game. All right. Did you want to add something? I mean, it seems to me one of the things I've heard here in Israel is is that you know the address is Tehran, not 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 um, Yemen, and um, I, and in and that and I, I don't know whether that uh, is how the U.S. is seeing the, seeing this. But um, uh, did you want to add anything on how Israel sees the the, the threat from the Houthis? Sure, I'm happy to. Um... From what I've heard so far, it seems like there's a lot of talk about how do we deter the, the Houthis. Um, and uh, I would say that concerns me to some degree. Um, I think that it's not really thinking about the Houthis um, as a long-term problem, which I think Israel is going to really have to start doing. Um, I think if you deter um, an adver adversary, then um, you're dealing with its intentions. You're not dealing enough with its capabilities. I think that given Israel's uh, exposed vulnerability at this point, um, it's the kind of thing that anytime the Houthis are having any sort of domestic crisis or challenge at home, they can start attacking Israeli ships again, 
They can start uh, lobbing uh, ballistic missiles at Israel. And I think that Israel, on the one hand, needs to deal with uh, Houthi intentions. And I think that in the immediate term, the goal for that should be what the Houthis are trying to achieve, try, try and come up with a solution that delivers the opposite outcome. Um, so they're trying to look very impressive to their domestic audience, make them look bad, do things that uh, expose that, that, let's say, for example, that they are incompetent or that, you know, like uh, one of the things that I suggested in, in my my, my uh, piece for Times of Israel was the Houthis are claiming to be this protector of Palestine. What you should do is target terrorist groups that are operating in Sana'a. So you have Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, PFLP, DFLP there, um, targeting uh, terrorist groups in Sana'a and showing that the Houthis can't even protect uh, Palestinians, Palestinian terrorist groups on their own soil, I think would be a very good outcome and show that these guys are not uh, as impressive as, as they're trying to claim to be. Um, that said, I don't think that deterrence is enough. I think that thinking of ways in order to um, deal with the Houthi capabilities for the long term is going to be an essential Israeli policy because um, I don't see this as a one-off event where you deter them uh, and then everything is fine. Obviously, deterrence is um, something that uh, wears down over time. And unfortunately, you only know when it hasn't worked in retrospect or, or when it's going to stop working in retrospect. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you can check and see, okay, we're still at 90%, we're good to go. It's the kind of thing that um, you really, uh, it's very intangible. Um, and so I think thinking about both intentions and capabilities will be important for Israel in the long term. Thanks, Ari. Um, we're just about out of time. I, I just want to point out, and in, in addition to thanking you both, uh, it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, that uh, there was also an attack on a, uh, an Israeli-related um, ship in, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and uh, this is uh, off the coast of India. And he here we see potentially um, these attacks drawing Israel and India perhaps closer together as a result, um, depending on how India chooses to respond to this. Uh, and, and I think its response has been fairly positive from an Israeli perspective. Um, it's unclear if this was a Houthi attack or an Iranian attack on, on, on the Israeli-related ship. Um, I, I've seen quotes suggesting that the Houthis usually claim responsibility when it's them, and um, in this case, they haven't, as far as I know. Um, uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, it raises perhaps an, an issue for a future discussion, which is the, the question not just the Bab al-Mandab in the Red Sea, which is where we've been focused on, but the broader uh, Indian Ocean space, which is a huge, huge space, um, you know, and and, and that get, gets into a set of issues, I think, that um, we in Israel historically haven't really um, had to deal with. Uh, and so I, I think perhaps we could, we, uh, I'll stop there and set, leave that as setting the stage for our next conversation in the future. And let me just thank you again. Uh, thank you both again for, for, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. Um, these are important issues, and I look forward to continuing to discuss them in the future. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Ari. It was a pleasure.